So, I thought tonight we would talk a little bit about chicken to start with. And I'll give a few thoughts on the subject. And then we can take your questions, whatever is on your mind. So, a couple of thoughts. First of all, if you've been here before, you may have noticed that I have a new quarantine haircut. Enough said about that. Um, and one other personal note. If you have followed me, you know that for the second year in a row, I was uh, among the top nine finalists for the Barbecue Hall of Fame. There's 20 living members in the Barbecue Hall of Fame. It was quite an honor to be nominated, and I was nominated two years in a row. And you are looking at the Susan Lucci of Barbecue. I was not elected to the Hall of Fame for two years in a row. Maybe next year. Um, I'm still a youthful 79, 71, 79, my God. Um, so hopefully we'll get in next year. Um, but, uh, it was an honor, as they say in Hollywood, it was an honor to be nominated. Um, okay. I thought we would dig in on chicken a little bit tonight because that's what I'm told America's favorite protein. We eat more chicken than anything. And without surprise, I mean, I, you know, it's amazingly cheap. It is not much more expensive than when I was in college, which was a long time ago. Um, the method of raising and handling and preparing and selling chicken has really been in, influenced by um, uh, the industrial age. Um, a lot of very interesting things have happened. And... Um, uh, the first thing we need to talk about is the safety issue. The way chicken is slaughtered, cleaned, packaged, butchered and packaged makes it the most likely of all of our favorite proteins to have contamination on it. Um, by contamination, um, salmonella and campylobacter are pretty common, E. coli, um, uh, these are back pathogens, bacteria, uh, that can make you sick. Uh, if you're immunocompromised or in ill health or elderly or young, they could be fatal. Rarely are, but um, you don't want to mess with it. When you've got grandma over for Memorial Day or Fourth of July and you're serving chicken, you don't want to have to take her to the emergency lab, emergency room. Um, about uh, in 2014, Consumer Reports did a really interesting project. They went out and they bought 300 chicken breasts all around the country. And they sent them to a lab and had them tested for pathogens. And they found that, are you sitting down? 90% had pathogenic bacteria. That is to say, 90% of them could make you sick. Now, that's pretty darn scary, but the good news is, is there's nothing to worry about if you cook it. Heat kills bacteria. And if you cook it, the minimum 160 to 165, and you are safe. All the bugs are dead. And, they, and at 165, they die in seven seconds. So, I mean, you know, the problem that makes chicken different than steak is if steak is going to be contaminated, and it can be, um, what happens when you're bringing a cattle in for slaughter? They're in these big pens, and they're wandering around, and they're pooping, and there's bacteria in the air. It gets on their hide, the slaughtering process. Um, and when the butchers start to butcher them, they begin by cutting open the gut. And they have to be careful not to cut open the intestines. But occasionally, those sharp knives will slit the intestines. If they do, bacteria spill out. They may get on the meat. They may get on the floor. They get on the knife. They can get on the cutting tables. But the thing is, is they only get on the surface of a steak. Um, they can't penetrate the steak. Uh, they're too darn big. Um, uh, they like garlic or sugar. They just can't penetrate. Salt can penetrate, but bacteria, garlic, and sugar are too big. They don't penetrate. 
So when you throw a steak on the grill, if it's hot, it kills these bacteria almost instantly. 165 kills almost everything. So you don't have to worry. Muscle meat, solid muscle meat, um, is rarely contaminated on the inside. Steak, pork, lamb. If there's contamination, and there can be, it's on the surface, and a few seconds of hot temperature cooking, you're safe. The issue is with chicken and the way it's handled. Among other things, it's dunked in a bath water. And if one of the birds has contaminated the bath water, say its intestines have been sliced open or they haven't been removed properly or whatever, if the bath water is contaminated, all of them are contaminated. And chicken meat is thinner, a little more porous, and so it's more likely to be risky. Um, so you really want to treat chicken a little differently than you do steak and pork and lamb. And you need to cook it to a higher temp. I mean, you can cook steak to 130, 135, which is medium rare, and it's perfectly safe. But chicken, you don't want to cook that low. 160 is, I, I would say, your minimum safe temp. Now, those of you who are into sous vide, we're not going to get into that right now. But this is a process that cooks the chicken for a very long time. And the temperature is one factor, but time is another factor. You can cook chicken at a lower temperature for a long time and pasteurize it. And yes, that's the right word. Pasteurized is not just a word for milk. Pasteurized means you've killed almost all the bacteria. Sterilized means you've killed them all. Um, sterilizing is extremely difficult and expensive. Pasteurizing is a little easier, and it's pretty darn safe. So you can kill those uh, bacteria at around 160, 165, and not sweat it. Um, so you absolutely need to cook chicken with a digital thermometer. I mean, I preach thermometers. You know that. You would think I had stock in a thermometer company. I do not. Um, we don't sell thermometers, but Bill McGrath is an electrical engineer. He used to be the head of electrical engineering at ExxonMobil. And Bill is retired, and uh, he is our thermometer tester. We send him every thermometer we get our hands on, and he has special equipment that he tests the speed and the accuracy and he beats on them, and uh, he sometimes pries them open, looks inside, and he cooks with them, and he tests thermometers. And if you go to AmazingRibs.com, you'll find oh, about 200 thermometers that he's tested and rated and reviewed. We don't sell any of them. We'll link you to Amazon or the manufacturer's website. Um, but you want a instant read or a rapid read thermometer that you can poke your chicken with and get an accurate temperature reading. You don't want to monkey around with chicken. And for that matter, you don't want to monkey around with steak. Not that it's a health risk. Steak's expensive. You don't want to serve well-done steak when everybody at the table wants medium rare. So an instant read thermometer is absolutely the single most important tool you can have this side of a sharp knife. Nothing will improve your cooking faster than having good thermometers. So get yourself a really good instant read and Bill's got a number of them that he recommends on uh, our website go to the ratings and review section look at thermometers uh, we give platinum gold silver medals pick a platinum medal winner I know that there's um, an, a rapid read uh, for like 16 bucks um, the thermopop which is a really well built is double that price it's 30 bucks that's not a lot of money when you consider how much money it will save you um, so go get yourself a good instant read thermometer if you're cooking chicken and steak or anything. Nothing will improve your cooking better. So, okay, now we, we're going to make sure that the, cooking, the chicken is cooked to a, a safe temperature. How do you cook it? Well, chicken has a natural built-in problem, the skin. And most of us, not everybody likes the skin because it's a lot of fat. It's fattier than the meat. Chicken meat's fairly lean. Even the legs, which are more fatty than the breasts, are not very fatty. That's pretty lean meat. Um, but the skin is a little fattier. So 
Oh, it's crying out loud. Oh, Lou! <laughs> for my wife. Um, the skin's fattier, so you want to, but when it's cooked properly, it's really crispy and it's really good. And if you do it right, you can get that skin, like that potato chip, a drum head. And, and, and if you've got it flavored and salted properly, that's, I think it's really good. I mean, it's right up there with bacon. Um, the problem is, is if you cook at too low a temperature, you're not rendering the fat. And so you're going to end up with rubbery, flabby chicken. So the thing is, is you should try, try to get your chicken at a higher temp than what we normally recognize, at least 325. But the problem we almost all face is we take chicken and we throw it on the grill. And by the time the skin is golden or even dark brown, it's not cooked in the center. Now, you can't tell when chicken is ready by looking at, you know, all the cookbooks say slice into it and look at the juices. When the juices run clear, it's done. This is no longer true. It may have been true in the 50s and 60s, but the way they raise chicken now, the pH of the meat and a bunch of other variables are interfering. And none of the, uh, the great cookbook authors are really on top of this. But you can cook chicken to 180, 190, which is well past safe, and still have pink meat or juicy or, or pink juices. You can't tell by the color of the juices or the color of the meat. Only a thermometer will tell you. Um, so um, the best way, and this, this holds true for a lot of cooking, is break the bird down. I know it's a lot of fun to cook the whole bird. But the thing that determines when food is done is its thickness. So the breast, which is a lot thicker than the wing, is going to take a lot longer to cook than the wing. And the breast is thicker than the thigh or the drumstick. So the cooking times really vary. Anytime you cook a whole animal, whether it's a chicken or a turkey for Thanksgiving or a whole hog for a wedding, you're going to be forced with sacrificial decisions. Let's talk about a whole hog. Um, the shoulder, which is where we make pulled pork, needs to cook up to 200 degrees plus. 203 is a good number to get really tender, succulent, juicy meat. Well past well done. But the tenderloins are best at 135 to 140. The loins are in that, at, at that one, same temperature, 135 to 140. Um, the hams, cook them way up to 190 plus. So to, when you cook a whole hog, you're either going to way overcook the loin or the tenderloin and way undercook the hams and the shoulders. You've got to make compromises, and the result is less than satisfactory. So the best way to cook a whole hog is to break it down into individual sections. Same thing for a turkey. Same thing for a chicken. When you break it down, you can control the internal temperature and take each piece to its ideal temperature and serve each piece ideally. And that's the best way to do it. Now, the issue then becomes the skin. And if you're like me, I like the skin on. I have been known to take the skin off on certain recipes and sometimes you can't even tell. But I do like chicken skin, and I don't eat chicken every night, and I don't eat chicken skin every night, so I'm not concerned about the risk, the health risk. Um, the best way to do the chicken is set up in a two-zone system. Uh, and by a two-zone system, I mean you divide your grill in half. You've got a hot side and a not hot side. If it's charcoal, all the charcoal's over here, and there's no charcoal over here. If it's um, a gas grill, um, burners on on one side, no burners on on the other side. And um, the way you deal with that is you start the chicken on the indirect side away from the heat and you gently warm it so that it gets up to about 150. Remember our target is 160. Take it up to about 150 on the indirect side with the lid down. You're going to bake it. You're going to roast it. 
You can throw wood on the fire, get smoke on the meat. That's wonderful, great idea. But gently cook it because meat is 70% water. It takes time for the heat to work its way to the center. So put it on the indirect side, take your time, let it warm gently, probe it. Don't worry about sticking it with a thermometer. 70% water. You got an eight ounce piece of chicken, it's six ounces of water. Stick it with a thermometer and a four drops of water leak out, you'll never miss it. Don't worry about it. Keep probing it until you get to about 150. Then when you hit 150, lift the lid and leave it open. Move the chicken from the indirect side to the hot side. Right over the flames, right over the coals. Now you're over infrared heat. Infrared heat is different than convection heat, which is what you're getting on the indirect side. Infrared heat is much more intense, much more powerful, much more energy, and it's like sunburn. It will cook it a lot faster. So you move it over to the infrared side, skin down, and stand there. Don't go for a beer. Don't go to the bathroom. Stand there and watch that skin like a hawk. And when it gets amber, golden, beautiful, flip it over, hit the other side. There's no skin on the other side. Hit the other side, let it get some good color. Check that temp when it hits 160, you're done. Get it off of there. So what we're talking about is a classic two zone system and reverse sear. And that's what we call reverse sear. Many of you know this concept. Start on the indirect convection airflow side, gently warm the meat to 150, move it to the direct infrared side, lid up, and pound it with energy on one side, flip it, pound it with energy on the other side, get it up to 160, it won't take long, get the exterior beautifully colored. On the indirect side, you cook the interior, on the direct side, you're cooking the exterior, and you're ready to eat, you're gonna have beautiful, brown, crispy chicken, um, uh, crispy skin, cooked to perfect temperature. Um, one other thing I wanna talk about, and then we can get on with your questions, and that is um, seasoning and salting. I think it's a really good idea to salt your chicken a few hours beforehand, if you can, overnight. Uh, we've talked about this before, but I can't emphasize it enough. Salt is the magic rock. Sodium and chloride, two little atoms, they get wet, they get electrically charged, they go to the center of the meat, they penetrate, they amplify flavor, they enhance your flavors. No other seasonings can do this. No other um, sugar, garlic, pepper, uh, all your herbs, they're going to stick on the surface, they can't really penetrate. And if you don't believe me, go to your spice rack, pour every damn spice you have on a chicken breast, cook the chicken breast, Cut it in half, taste a core sample, you won't taste any of it. It doesn't get in. Salt will get in there, salt will amplify the flavor and retain helps retain moisture. It's magic. So, what do you season um, um, a chicken with? There's a lot of different ways to go. I know a lot of folks out there are big fans of the recipe that I have on AmazingRibs.com for Meathead's Memphis Dust. Um, and that's a really good um rub recipe that works it's primarily designed for pork but it works great on chicken i'm a fan of herbs on chicken rather than spices i like the green things i like time is my all-time favorite all all hands everything it works on everything um uh, tarragon is another one uh, uh, rosemary uh, whatever you like um, dry or fresh it really isn't a huge difference but I like to use herbs on at like, well when you buy poultry spices poultry seasoning rather it's mostly green herbs so play with those spices um, it, and if you want go to amazingribs.com and look for the um, uh, Simon and Garfunkel rub recipe uh, parsley sage rosemary and thyme um, it's really a nice recipe for poultry. So th that's my approach to chicken. Um, I, there's one other thing I should tell you about, and that is um, everybody out there who loves fried chicken, raise your hands. Yeah, I, I, all of you, I know. And you don't cook it indoors, do you? 
because it just makes a mess of the stovetop and it smokes up the kitchen and it sets off the smoke alarm do your fried chicken on a gas grill you can do it on a charcoal grill but it's a little better on a gas grill it's no more dangerous than cooking it inside in fact it's probably safer you get a dutch oven put about an inch of oil in the dutch oven get your chicken bread it flour it however you like you can do flour then egg then flour you can do flour then egg then breadcrumbs or whatever there you can use a batter i've got concept i have a whole number of articles on this approach and you fry you get the oil up to 375 don't put too much cold chicken in the oil otherwise temperature will take a nosedive and fry it on your gas grill it's fantastic and it doesn't stink up the house it doesn't set off the smoke alarm and you take the temperature if the um, crust is absolutely beautiful golden um, and you take the temperature and the interior is not quite there yet you take it out of the oil and you lay it on the grill you put more food in the oil and that stuff that's laying on the grill you just close the lid and it's gonna roast it's gonna come up to safe temperature it's just a really good way to do fried chicken it's really tasty I'll tell you and the easiest thing as some of my favorite is you just take the chicken and make sure the surface is wet with water is enough get your hands wet wet the surface roll it in flour and that's all it's not gonna be a thick crunchy crust but it's delicious now if you want that thick crunchy crust then you go into the egg or the buttermilk or the buttermilk and then the flour and you, you, you know, there are a variety of approaches I mean flour and cornstarch is a nice thing and I've got that concept on the side you can take a look but the bottom line is is fried chicken do it on the on a gas grill it's fantastic okay um that's my uh, little intro spiel for the night um, I've burned up half an hour already um, so let's uh, scroll through and uh, see what kind of questions you've got uh, John Rogers says he'll <laughs> he'll work my techie for free if I adopt him yeah John I'll tell you um, I'm definitely in over my head that in fact just let me take a quick look over here and see if we ever did get up and running on um, no we're still trying to stream on YouTube it's not going through I think we're going through on Twitter I'm not gonna check yeah I don't know what that black box is somebody says picture in picture but I don't think it is it's I think it's because I had to try to start this thing be cute with a video and if I get try to get rid of it it just blocks the screen I don't know what it is and I'm not gonna worry about it you, you got a big big black box there the hell with it um, Oh, Colin James in Australia. Hello, Colin. Um, uh, Dan Bliss jumped over from Twitter. I'm curious, Dan, was it is it streaming on Twitter? Uh, the closed caption is lagging beneath. The, all right, all right, all right, I, don't, I don't know how Facebook does that. Um, okay. Uh, all your volunteers for IT. Uh, drop me a note. I might be able to use you. Um, yeah, on YouTube it says standby. It's I can tell from this end it's not it's not it's not streaming. Where do you fall on the wash don't wash chicken spray? Okay, this is a good question. Um, the uh, food scientists and I think they're right about this tell you not to wash the chicken. Uh, now I know you open that thing and it's kind of slimy. Um, um, I mean if you have to, you can wash it. I am a little iffy on this what the food scientists are warning us against is if you take that chicken and you put it under the faucet bacteria are going to aerosolize they're going to fly up and right next to the sink is where you got the dish drain and you got clean dishes in there and you got silverware in there and you got pots and pans in there so now you're aerosolizing pathogens and we know they're on chicken so you're going to be contaminating uh, cross-contaminating your uh, stuff whatever's in the dish drain or the sink or the faucet and the handles or your skin so they got a really good point about that on the other hand when it's really gross and slimy 
I would like to clean it. Now, the evidence is, is it doesn't matter. You throw it on the grill and you're not going to taste it. Um, as a safety issue, if the chicken's fresh, I don't wash it. If the chicken's really slimy, don't tell anyone. I'll wash it, but I'll be very careful. The faucet is on low, and I'll be very careful. I'll try not to splash and splatter. That's my approach, um, and uh, I'll let you decide what you want to do about that. Ah, um, David Otten is asking about dry brining. Um, uh, dry brining is just another word for salting the meat. Um, and I'm a big fan of dry brining. In fact, uh, 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 one of our followers just did a really interesting dry brining test where he did turkey legs, dry brine, wet brine, and no brine, and agreed with me that dry brine and wet brine came out about the same, both better than no brine. Salt, as I said, is magic. It amplifies flavor and holds on to moisture. Um, brining is when you make up a moist, a, a, a liquid of salt and water, and it's roughly the same salinity as an ocean. And um, you throw the bird in there, and the salt penetrates, um, and it does its magic. But you don't have to do that. You can just sprinkle the salt. Our rule of thumb is one half a teaspoon of Morton's kosher salt per pound of meat. Now, I say Morton's kosher salt. All of our recipes are standardized on Morton's kosher salt. It has no additives. It's an easy size flake to manage. Crystal brand kosher salt is a different size, so you use a different quantity. Table salt is a different size. You use a different quantity. We've got a, um, a calculator on the website that will help you translate when we say Morton's kosher salt, and that's you don't have it, you only have table salt or diamond crystal or whatever you can tr translate, but they're different. Table salt is twice as salty as Morton's kosher salt, um, so you use only half as much. But I'm a big fan of dry brining. You sprinkle the salt on half a teaspoon per pound and walk away. It takes time for the salt to work its way to the bottom or to the center, and um, a rule of thumb, I don't know, maybe... Uh, uh, half an inch per hour or something like that. So, you know, uh, a chicken, a couple of hours, probably fine. We know this. We know that Professor Blondard, who works with us, a uh, food scientist, proved that when you're cooking, the heat, not surprisingly, makes the chick makes the salt move faster. So it will continue to move towards the center faster while it's cooking. So it doesn't have to get all the way to the center bef when you dry brine. But just sprinkle the salt on, give it a couple hours to penetrate, and then start cooking. You don't have to put it in a bucket. And if you're doing a bucket of water with black pepper and garlic and sugar and apple juice, you're wasting money. Because none of that can get in. It just gets on the surface. So if you want black pepper, you want sugar, you want garlic, sprinkle it on instead of dumping it in the vat. Um, somebody else mentioned spatchcocking. There he is. Cannon Taylor likes to spatchcock. Spatchcock is a good technique. What spatchcocking is, it's butterflying. Um, you, you, you remove the backbone and you spread it out and it works. I use it occasionally. I use it, I used to do it a lot, but I now break it down because even though it spreads it out and the beauty of spatchcocking is it browns the interior. When you do a whole bird, the cavity doesn't brown on the inside. Brown is beautiful. Brown is flavor. Brown is a chemical reaction called the Maillard reaction. And that interior remains tan and gray, and it just never gets colorized. And it doesn't get flavorized. So spatchcocking, you open it up, and you can get both sides brown. But you're still faced with the situation of the breast is thicker, and it takes more time to cook. Um, and the thighs which are a little fattier. I think they're best at around 170, where the breast is best at around 160. I'd rather cut it up and temp each piece individually and um, take them off individually and get each piece at perfect. Um, okay. Yeah, um, uh, Jean-Marc Demer. Hey, Jean-Marc, I remember seeing your name 
from previous. Uh, thank you for coming back. Um, he's read that putting the bird in the fridge to air dry helps the gets the skin crispier. True or false? Yeah, it does help a little bit. Um, the health commission will fine you if you're a restaurant for leaving meat in the refrigerator uncovered. You got to have a plastic cover on it because they're always worried about cross contamination. If your broccoli gets on the chicken, then your broccoli is contaminated. But if you feel like you can keep prevent cross contamination, circulating air um, on the skin will help dry the skin and help get the skin crispy. But there's nothing going to make it crispier better than high temperature. So, you know, hit it with the high heat on the infrared and you'll get it good and crispy. But, yeah, air drying will help a little bit, I think. All right, we got, um, oh boy, I'm going to slaughter your name, but you'll forgive me. Um, whoops. Um, Irena's Slonina. Um, I got the last name. I know. Slonina. Mr. Slonina. Slonina. Uh, has a question about beef loin roast on a pellet grill. Is it safe to keep the roast at 160 for high smoke for four to five hours until the center is 135? Absolutely, not a problem. Beef is a very low contamination risk. If there's contamination, it's on the surface and it's going to die almost instantly at 160 or higher. I would prefer you cook it at a higher temperature um, because you'll get a better bark, a better crispy skin, and it'll cook a little faster and kill bacteria. Um, uh, anything under 150, eh, 130, 135 is a good cutoff. Um, uh, anything above 135 is probably safe, but 160 is okay. Uh, when I do beef roast, I just, um, I, again, I do reverse sear. I do one every year for Christmas. If you go to AmazingRibs.com, you'll see a page about how I do beef roast for Christmas. I do it very weird. I take the bones off. That's a meal. I remove the spinalis dorsi, which is a muscle that wraps around the uh, eye of the ribeye, and it's absolutely fabulous. It's the best muscle on the animal. I take that off, and I save that for another meal. I now have the eye of the ribeye, which is the longissimus dorsi, which is the center of the ribeye, and that's what I cook for Christmas dinner. It's gorgeous. Every piece is identical, and I give it a really great rub, and I will start with a reverse sear, gently warming it so that it's perfect, even temperature, and then sear it over really high temperature um, at the end to get that good, crispy, crusty skin. Um, and this year, I did it sous vide. I actually did it in the water bath for the, uh, for the first couple of hours and then seared it. It's fantastic. And I've written about that on our website. Uh, Doug, oh, hey, Doug. Uh, Doug Scheiding is here. Um, he says he fries his chicken on a pellet grill. Well, if you can get that pellet grill generating enough heat to get the oil up to 375, why not? Man, Facebook has got all these questions jumping around. I'm going to get a headache. Um, Jim Kopak, I use a pound of lard and a stick of butter. I presume you're talking about frying. That's Craig Claiborne's recipe. Um, sure, why not? The only thing about butter is butter has water in it. And so when you try to heat butter, it goes up to 212, and it can stick at that temp for a little bit while it burns off the water. Then it can go on up to 375. So you're better off getting ghee or clarified butter. Brian Carnes, my book's a lifesaver. Thank you. Um, uh, Carolina Barbecue versus Kansas City. Which do I prefer? Ooh, that's a tough one. I mean, I'm a sucker for sweet red Kansas City style sauce, just like everybody. I did, I did, I did some ribs with a Kansas City style sauce for uh, Memorial Day, and we were just yeah, you know, fingers, mustache, everywhere. How can you not love that? Carolina barbecue is very vinegary, and I'm a vinegar lover. I I have been known to just pour myself a little sip of. I have some really fancy high end balsamico, and it's like a liqueur. 
I love vinegars. No, I'm not a fanatic about drinking apple cider vinegar. I don't know if you've noticed. There's this whole cult over apple cider vinegar. I just like it. So I don't mind. I re And I like the Carolina-style barbecue sauces. They're very vinegary on pulled pork. Um, I like Kansas City on ribs. So I'm, I'm ACDC there. Graham Wilson. What do you make of competition cooks taking the skin off? Yeah, and th yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and competition cooking is a very strange aberration. And I've written about this on AmazingRibs.com. There's an article there called Don't Cook Like You See Them Cooking on TV. Competition cooking is you cook so that the judges will blow their minds with one bite. And one of the things they uh, are always struggling to get is when you bite into a chicken skin or a chicken thigh in particular they want a clean bite so you go through the skin into the meat and you get both in your mouth if you bite into the thigh and all the skin comes off in your mouth which can happen uh, the judges tend to kick your ass um it's an issue and so the competition cooks go through all kinds of stuff they peel the skin back. They scrape the fat off. They do all kinds of gymnastics. I mean, it does work. Um, you know, when it's my wife and me or even my neighbors and my friends, just a good reverse sear. I can get a really good crispy skin. But again, I'm doing herbs. I'm not doing red sauce, which is what they all do because that's the standard. Um, competition cooking if you ask a great competition cook, and I've asked many of them this question, do you cook like that at home? The answer is hell no. First of all, it's too much trouble, and the flavors are just so intense. Remember, they're trying to knock the judges out of their seat with one bite. Uh, John Rogers, what flavor profile do I prefer? Lump with wood chunks or 100% sticks? What is the taste difference? Okay. First of all, 100% sticks, it means, I think you mean logs. They call it stick burners. Um, absolutely the very best barbecue I know usually comes from a stick burner. Um, now, it comes from a stick burner that is run by somebody who knows how to run a stick burner. Um, stick burners have to be managed carefully. The blend of air to wood is crucial. You get too much uh, or not enough oxygen and it's going to smell like uh, and taste like an ashtray so th there's a whole thing about blue smoke and if you go to amazingribs.com and search on the word combustion it should take you to an article about um, how different kinds of combustion work on wood and how they alter the flavor and what is blue smoke why we love it and so on um, I am not a lump charcoal fan if you go to AmazingRibs.com and search on charcoal, you'll find an article uh, where I talk about the difference between lump and briquette. Um, there's a great deal of feeling that lump is more natural because lump charcoal is just chunks of wood thrown in the retort and they're, 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 they're um, um, uh, charred, cooked down to... Um, uh, char and um, uh, if, if you don't do it right I mean it, a big chunk the center can still have a lot of cellulose and lignin in it and then it smokes and it sparks and I don't know what kind of wood that is I don't know whether that's pine or oak or cherry and it can create a lot of smoke my attitude is charcoal is for heat not flavor. Wood is for flavor. My attitude is I use briquettes. I, 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 I use um, Kingsford Blue Bag when, I, when it's really, really cheap. But Kingsford and Weber and a bunch of others now make briquettes that have no binders, no additives. They don't scare me, yet, but I, you know, it, they're pure. So I buy the no binder. I think it's the Kingsford Professional. Weber is all the Weber briquettes or no binders. Uh, Royal Oak, I think, has one. And the reason I love briquettes is because they're all identical. 
Every single one of them is identical. Every single one is carbonized to the center. One briquette produces X amount of energy. Two briquettes produce twice as much. Three briquettes, three times as much. You go into a bag of lump and you've got stuff the size of a softball and stuff the size of a fingernail. So you really can't control the energy. You don't know how much energy you got. You don't know how much smoke you got coming out of it. And I got to tell you also on that charcoal article, I have pictures people have sent me of things they have found in bags of lump, including plastic, metal, and other stuff. I don't believe that it's always properly prepared. So I'm a, and, and when I, you know, I have a, a Weber charcoal chimney and it holds 80 briquettes. Half of it holds 40 briquettes. Now I have control and I am a control freak. I want control. Cooking is all about control, temperature control. I'm a briquette man. Yeah, Doug says he starts his uh, Traeger at 375 for frying. Okay, man, you got it. Uh, David Ram, uh, Ram Jam Swanson uh, is uh, lamenting the loss this week of Hecky Powell, who is uh, an, uh, a stalwart in the Chicago barbecue scene. And Hecky died this week of um, COVID. Um, a, a great loss. Um, best way to reheat leftovers, ribs, brisket, pulled pork, beans. Um, yeah, you know, the question, he said anything good in reheat. Yeah, I think microwave is often the best way to reheat. Now, if you have a sous vide machine, that's a good way to, you put it in a Ziploc bag, you put it in a uh, water bath, you heat the water bath to the precision temperature, that works. But microwaves are really good. They, um, if you get the timing right, they can get it heated pretty evenly. You don't want big lumps in a microwave because sometimes it heats unevenly. You want to spread things out. But um, uh, now, you know, things like pulled pork. Uh, pulled pork is easily brought back to life with a splash of apple juice and maybe throwing it in a fry, into a saucepan or a, um, a crock pot on a low temperature. The, the problem is, is a lot of things when left over are not as good as when fresh. Um, they begin to dehydrate, they dry out. Um, so you've got to bring moisture back. So you got pulled pork, it's delicious the first day. The second day, you got to add moisture, apple juice or barbecue sauce or whatever. Um, uh, you, you, you've got to replenish the moisture. So I, I, I use the microwave a lot for that. Um, I've tried sous vide and it works fine. You know, microwave is pretty easy. And I've been, you know, it's, it's just my wife and me. And I'll, I'll do a five pound pork butt. And that means I just bag it up, zipper, zipper bag it, or vacuum bag it, throw it in the freezer in two person servings. And they sit there for weeks, pull them out, um, take them out of the bag. So then they're not, I don't like putting plastic in the microwave um, and just put them in a, um, uh, a microwave proof, bowl or plate and uh, you know give them a, a minute stir it up give it another minute stir it up and throw on some sauce or some apple juice to replenish the moisture and it, it, it's pretty good ah that's a really good question Jeremy Kunkel um, a lot of sous vide Q recipes, um, uh, and I've written a at length about sous vide Q. Sous vide plus barbecue is a really nice combo. And I'm a real strong believer you do the sous vide and the smoking afterwards. Smoking beforehand has very little impact on the outcome. Um, and then I say do it at 225. Is there a reason not to do it at a lower temp um, so you don't have to worry about overcooking? Good point. Um, you have to reheat it to a safe temperature at 225 you're really not going to dry it out and one of the things that i have done is almost all my recipes have 225 involved unless it's poultry and then it's 325 and the reason for that is i want you to master your devices i want you to learn to control and now when i started writing about barbecue there was no pellet smokers and dial in your temperature 
I, I, but it's still important whether you're smoking on a uh, log burner or a Weber Smoky Mountain, you got to master your control of temperature. Um, and so for me, for you, I say master 225. That's a good number for just about everything and 325 for poultry. If you can, and, and, and it ain't easy. It ain't, you know, um, just how many briquettes, how, you know, what's the air temperature? How's the wind? Is it raining? You know, you have to adjust for all these things. On a cold winter day, you've got to add more charcoal and more oxygen. On a hot summer day, less charcoal, less oxygen. So if you can nail 225, master your tool, uh, you're fine. If you have a pellet smoker or something with digital control and you want to smoke it at 150, nothing wrong with that. Uh, Doug Scheidling, who knows what he's talking about, says sous vide is his favorite way to bring food back, uh, reheat. Um, you know, every I'm always surprised at how many people don't know what sous vide is. So I'll give you the 30 second summary. Um, when you cook on an in an oven, in a frying pan, in a grill, or a smoker, you set a temperature that is usually much higher than what you're targeting. So if you're going to do a steak, your target's 130, 135, medium rare. If you're going to do chicken, your target's 160. Um, even pulled pork or brisket, your target's 203. But you're cooking up at 225, 325, maybe high. So it's like trying to catch a moving train. You know, um, uh, you got to jump off that, or get, get off a moving train. You got to jump off at the right time. You got to catch that food when it's at the exact temperature. Sous vide is a technique where you put the food in a Ziploc bag or a, um, a, a resealable bag. You, you, you get all the oxygen out of it and you put it in a bath of water and you put a, a heater in the water and, the, and you set the temperature. So if you're going to do a medium rare steak, you set it for 130 and it heats the water to 130 and the water heats the meat to 130. You can't overcook it. It can't go to 155. It can't go to 145. It can't go to 135. It can go up to 130 and that's it. And that's perfect medium rare. So you can never overcook a steak and it can hold at that temperature for hours. And it's really tender and really juicy. The problem is is you don't get a lot of flavor. Um, when you take it out of the bag, it's butt ugly. It's gray, tan. It doesn't have any Maillard reaction, doesn't have any searing. And I don't care how many herbs and spices and oils and everything else you throw in the bag, it really doesn't get in. It really doesn't flavorize it much. So you take it out and you've got, I mean, if you've got a beautiful Wagyu steak, it's going to be gorgeous, but it's not going to be what it could be. So now you've got to sear it. You throw it in a hot pan or you throw it on a hot grill. Um, and now you can amp up the flavor. Um, and Or you can throw it in a smoker. Um, and I love those techniques. And I, we did a book. Um, it came out in January called Sous Vide Q. And it's on Amazon. It's a Kindle book for $3.99. And it contains everything I've learned about sous vide and barbecue combo. And everything, even including using a blowtorch um, to finish the meat, uh, go spend $3.99 and get a uh, useful book if you're into sous vide. It's a really cool technique, um, and it's a great technique for reheating food because you can set the temp, and you know anything over 140 is palatable temperature, 140, 145. We don't like things much cooler than 140. We feel like it you know, needs to be warmed up. Um, uh, most of us, our uh, palates want something in the 140 to 150 range. So you can reheat your leftover food at 140 to 150, and it feels and tastes great. Do I ever grill with fresh herbs? Yeah, um, dried herbs are easier to grill with, obviously, because they burn and they smoke. Um, of course, it makes the neighborhood smell like I've got marijuana going. And until Illinois uh, made marijuana legal... Um, I was always nervous that somebody was going to bust me. Um, but um, 
um, my wife is a serious gardener and we have lots of fresh herbs in fact we picked our first basil tonight she did some pasta creamy pasta sauce threw some fresh basil on it tonight um, and yeah um, you can you can um, lay meat on top of fresh herbs and put it over fire and it will exude um, aromatic oils um, one of the techniques I've played with is you get this gadget for fish it looks like two tennis rackets hinged at the top but instead of putting the food inside put the herbs inside so load this thing up with herbs and then you put the meat on top like it's a, a grill grate and now the herbs are in there but they're not really touching the meat so they can smoke they can burn and they can put their flavor onto the meat you can flip the meat over and that, that's a fun technique you can get some flavors in there it's not as strong a flavor as just putting the herbs on the meat I mean you know fresh thyme just does wonders for everything um, it's it really becomes just another source of smoke ah what's in the wine glass asked Brad I um, some of you may know that I was once the wine critic for the Chicago Tribune and the Washington Post uh, Gustav Lawrence is one of the best Alsace producers and uh, uh, I, I really fond and for some reason his prices haven't gone through the roof and this is his Gewürztraminer and very refreshing easy drink I love it um, it's I buy it by the case uh, um, it, it, it's really versatile it's a very distinctive strong flavor um, Keith Vincent I'm doing my first curing what should I be looking for in a pork line for Canadian bacon should I stick to basic pork belly bacon no 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 um, pork uh, thickness has, is everything to do with everything just go to amazingribs.com and look for the Canadian bacon recipe and follow that that'll get you there perfect you've got to cure it much longer than you would regular bacon um, you don't have to worry about all the other flavorings and seasonings when we do belly bacon I do throw things in there like uh, maple syrup and stuff it doesn't penetrate but it gets on the surface and since it's fairly thin it really has an impact on the flavor Canadian bacon is four inches thick um, whatever you put on the surface is not going to penetrate very deep the cure is what's going to flavor it and the salt um, but go go read my Canadian bacon recipe and that'll take you home um, and also it's linked to an article that talks a lot about safety when it comes to curing and how much um, uh, nitrite is safe and so on we, uh, we can hold your hand on that one um, Greg Grolemund is asking about thoughts on the new gravity feed charcoal grills um, you're referring probably to the um, Oh, great, Scott. I'm drawing a blank. It just came out. Um, somebody help me. What's the name of the new brand? That just, um, uh, Husky uh, on our team just tested and reviewed this new Gravity Feed pel um, a charcoal grill and smoker and loved it. He's got a couple of little complaints about it, um, but we just published a detailed, lengthy review of it and it's on you'll find a link to it on our homepage. and he loved it it sounds like a really cool tool basically it works like a pellet smoker only it's charcoal very cool concept and we also just put this is another one we also just published a review of a product called a nuke n-u-k-e it's from i think argentina uh dave joachim our editor did the review and it's a classic Brazilian Argentinian wood burning grill and it's really well designed and it's reasonably priced for backyard um, I mean if you want to play with fire you want to burn wood and you want to grill steaks over wood um, this is really well designed um, uh, really interesting concept <coughs> very similar to what's becoming popular in the restaurants Miles Traphagen says, I can attest to the bad quality control of mesquite lump from Mexico. I find propylene rope, yeah, metal, plastic bag, oh my God. I quit buying it. If you get the 50-pound bags, about 10 of it is shake, which is 
little tiny thumbnail size and dust. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I'm not a, I'm not a lump fan. A lot of people swear by because it, it feels natural. It feels like God gave you this charcoal, and you know, I mean, if you're a fanatic about everything has got to be organic and grass fed, and you'd never touch a hot dog unless your wife isn't watching. <laughs> Then go burn lump. I just think briquettes are a better way to go. Um, do I ever crutch beef ribs? And if so, for how long? Okay. The, he, he's asking about a, a process called the um, Texas crutch. And it's a process that is often used in low and slow cooking. Um, at some point during the cook, you wrap the meat in either foil or butcher paper and what happens is, is it's now in an enclosed environment and um, it, it, the moisture can't evaporate and cool the meat. If you leave um, at 225, for example, if you do a brisket or a pork butt at 225, it gets to a point somewhere around 150, 170. It depends on the meat. It depends on the humidity. It depends on what you're cooking on. But somewhere in that range, you hit a point called the stall. And at, at that point, you got a stasis um, where moisture is evaporating from the surface and cooling the meat at the same rate that the warm air is heating the meat. So it doesn't go up in temperature. It just stays there. It gets, it, 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 it's like sweat it, 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 on your skin. When you're cutting along, the sweat cools you off. And it stays there until the skin dries out, the surface dries out, and you begin to build your bark. <clears throat> bark is essentially um, uh, jerky. It, it's dried meat. So at, when you hit that point where you're building jerky, building bark, then the temperature goes back up. And what a lot of people will do is they'll wrap it in foil or uh, 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 butcher paper, and that captures the moisture and it, it speeds the cooking because it doesn't evaporate. And it also helps tenderize. Um, and it helps hold in moisture. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a popular technique. Um, so Craig Dashell's asking, do I crutch beef ribs? Now, what you didn't ask is what kind of beef ribs. Um, they're basically, for our purposes, we'll say two kinds. Um, <clears throat> There's the back ribs, which are like baby back ribs. <clears throat> They're the ribs that are attached to the prime rib roast. And if you peel them off, <clears throat> which I do when I buy a prime rib, there's very little meat on the surface. All the meat is in between the rope bones. And they cook fairly quickly in about three hours. Um, and uh, I don't bother to crutch those. But the other kind of ribs are the ones that come from further down the side. And those are, <coughs> excuse me, I got a tickle in my throat. <coughs> I don't know why. Um, in the NAMP, the North American Meat Processors book, they are 123A. Remember that. NAMP 123A. That's what you tell the butcher you want. They're, um, they, 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 they come from the side. And they're typically about eight inch long bones and maybe four of them, which makes them about eight inches wide. And on one side, the meat is maybe two inches thick. These are the dinosaur ribs that so many of the great Texas barbecue joints serve. Um, the, the meat on the other bone, is it, it thins down as you get, so it's maybe only a half an inch on one, on one of the four bones. But um, they're fantastic. And, and these are worth crutching, yes. Um, take them up to the stall, 150, 160. Get a good dark brown on them. When they stall or when you like the color, wrap them and take them on up to 203 or so. Take the paper off. Either serve them or put them back on and dry out the surface so you have a little more of a crust. Or throw them on a gas grill just to dry out the surface and build crust, or throw them under your broiler to dry out the surface and get a little crust. Either way, all three methods work, um, but crutching is a good idea for 
the um, sh short ribs, which are the side ribs, um, and w code 123A. Tim Hausler says, wax paper in a microwave is okay. He learned that from a fourth generation sausage maker. You know, there's stuff that's called wax paper, but it doesn't have wax on it. I wonder about that. I don't want wax on my food. Um, I, I think wax paper has become a generic name. I don't know. I think it's often used for food, for paper that doesn't have wax on it. Uh, if it doesn't have wax on it, I might be willing to try it in a microwave, but... Uh, I don't think I want wax. I, I, maybe maybe the melt point is different than I think. What type of barbecue do you use when cooking for your, myself? You know, my wife will attest to this. I'm always experimenting and I'm always effing up. Um, I'm always trying new stuff. I'm always experimenting. I'm always trying to write new recipes. I'm always pushing the limits. And I have had more disasters than any of you. Even the novices and newbies, I just absolutely destroy food um, all the time. Um, but when I'm testing smoking recipes, I use a Mac two-star gas uh, pellet grill. Um, I, it, it, I love the Mac, but it could be any pellet grill. And the reason I love pellet grills for testing recipes is you set that temperature and you know it's going to go to that temperature and stay there. And I'm not going to have to be running in and out and opening the vents, closing the vents, adding more charcoal, um, and monkeying around. I mean, I love my Weber Smoky Mountain. Um, I've had a Lang stick burner. I mean, I've made... I have a Karubiku, which is absolutely ungodly wonderful. If you want to cook with logs and you want the flavor that wood can give you, nothing cooks better than a Karubiku. K-A-R-U-B-E-C-U-E. -E. Go read the review on AmazingRibs.com. Totally awesome. Um, amazing machine. But you got to babysit it. You're constantly adding wood. You're constantly fiddling with the vents. But oh my God, does that thing make great food. Um, so I got them all. And I play with them all. I find myself using my Weber kettle a lot. I For Memorial Day, it was just... Um, two half slabs of some sort. <laughs> Here we go, experimenting. I got my hands on some sort of heritage breed hog, and I was gonna see if I liked the flavor of this heritage breed hog. And I, you know, I should have paid attention to the fact that it was really thin. And when I was done trimming off the really thick slabs of fat, it was even thinner. And I put it on like uh, 1 o'clock, figuring dinner at 5, 6. And uh, they were done at 3. I mean, it was just... <laughs> and so, you know, my wife is... She was going to do the side. She's not ready with the potatoes. And, you know, hold them. <laughs> They're burning. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm always screwing them. But I did those on a Weber kettle. I love the slow and sear insert for the Weber kettle. If you have a Weber kettle... Get a slow and sear or somewhere under a hundred bucks, but it will make your kettle into a awesome smoker and it will improve your searing. Uh, again, we've reviewed this product. Remember, we don't sell any of these products. I mean, when I'm endorsing a product here, I'm not paid to endorse it. I have never accepted a penny to endorse a product. Um, we don't accept junkets. We don't go any, you know, we'd like to fly you to our factory. We don't do that. We did for a little while we put a lid on that um uh we don't accept endorsement we've had plenty of companies say if you'll say how much you love our product we'll pay you lots of money and we turn it down we depend on memberships we need you to join our pitmaster club to keep us alive and 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 pay for our unbiased opinions um okay food on fire Good rock or gas? Hmm. Not sure I understand this sentence. Okay, food on fire, good rock or gas? If your gas grill has these little lava rocks, they're nice. They work. Uh, I think that's your question. I don't know. Um, try that question again.
Al Whiter has asked, did I ever meet Carl Kolchak when working for the Chicago paper? No, I didn't. I worked for the Chicago Tribune in the 70s. Was it that long ago? I wrote the wine column for three years. Okay, guys, you got to try writing in English. Now, I know I got people from other countries, and I don't want to make jokes about what what is your first language. I want short wrists UT impossible. I'm not going to call you out by name, Bradley. I want short ribs UT impossible. I have no idea what you want. Uh, oh, John Venturini says our Canadian baker recipe is great. Okay. There's your endorsement. It is a good recipe. It works. Master Bill. Thank you, Rick. Um, the charcoal feed, um, gravity feed grill and smoker is made by Master Bill. Thank you. Hey, old man, I mean, I, I still have full command of vocabulary, but I struggle sometimes with proper names. I mean, I sometimes I can't remember my wife's name. No, that's not true. Um, it's the weirdest thing when you get old. Um, I, you know, I can still um, write in f with florid terms, but I'll forget, you know, what is that thing over there, you know? Oh, sorry. Uh, question about curing pork belly or other meats. I'm having problems with salinity in the final product. Uh-huh. I'm following Cure Calculator. That's our Cure Calculator. I have awesome looking product. However, the finished product is too salty. After curing, I'm putting in cold water, but the end is usually too much. How to fix it? The alternative way of curing. Okay. Um, do you love bronze, brunette, brunettes, or redheads? Um, salt is really a matter of taste, and everybody has their own level. I've seen it here in my own family. Um, what I think is just right, I know people who think it's way too salty and others who think it's not salty enough. And we've struggled with this on our wet recipes. I think we have found the right middle ground. But we hear this often. This recipe is too salty, particularly when it comes to curing. Um, what I recommend is, is you do the recipe according to our recipe first, because I think we have found the right balance. But if it's too salty for you, then the next time you do it, use less salt. Don't cut back on the um, pink salt, which is your curing salt. Cut back on the Morton's kosher salt um, and see how that works. The other op op option is, is that often we want you to use a lot of salt in the curing process to make sure it's safe, especially for a very thick piece of meat like a ham um, or, or for pastrami or something. Um, and then we tell you to throw it in a bucket of cold water in the fridge overnight to desalinate. And that removes some of the salt. I know it sounds crazy. Step one, add salt. Step two, take it away. But um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a safety issue. But for most meats, like pork belly, um, if it's just too salty, cut back on the salt. Not the cure, but on the salt. And you'll get there. You'll get there just fine. Um, everybody's taste is different. Best technique for pork loin. Ah, you know, pork loin is just the nastiest thing this side of turkey breast. There's just zero fat in there. And as we all know, fat is flavor, at least on modern commodity hogs. I mean, if you can get your hands on a red wattle or one of these other, you know, Berkshire or these other uh, heritage or exotic hogs, um, you can get... Uh, pork loin that has some marbling uh, the fat layer on the surface isn't going to help you at all you need marbling inside the meat and you've just got a lean lean I mean this is when pork wanted to be the other white meat they wanted to be like chicken they wanted to compete because we we're all scared of fat and pork loin and chicken breasts and turkey breasts are just really ornery pieces of meat to get right and the secret is is don't overcook it. First of all, start with a dry brine. Use that dry brine. Salt will amplify the flavor and it will help hold on to moisture. That's important. Um, salt is your friend. It's not too much. I don't care if your doctor tells you beware of your salt. 
half a teaspoon per pound. It doesn't all stay in there. It's much less than you're getting on uh, fast food. Number two, um, keep the temperature down. When you cook at a high temperature, protein shrinks and squeezes out moisture. So back off. We, I mean, the tendency of the greatest mistake that beginners make is they cook too hot. So back off on the temperature, slow down, cook at a lower temp. Number three, um, um, don't take pork loin past 140. Now you're going to come out with a piece of slightly pink meat. And that may give some people nerves. But there has been no trichinosis in pork in years. The last cases of trichinosis came from bear meat. Don't undercook bear meat. But pork is safe. I mean, it's muscle meat, just like steak. You could cook it to 130, which is medium rare. If you've never had pork loin at 135, which is medium rare, just like you would a steak, it's pink. You've never had pork. It's gorgeous. It's tender and juicy, just like a medium rare steak. It's flavorful. But for most people, that's just too undercooked. So I say take it up to 140. And see what the, your family says. They may get the heebie-jeebies, but 140, it's perfectly safe. It's, it, 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 the USDA now says 145, so you're not very far below. And they always err on the, on the high side. Um, 140, and if you want to experiment, just do, do, do a little batch at 135. You'll be blown away. It's a whole different... You, you won't even recognize it as pork. Um, Thomas French says COVID. Uh, what, are you, what are you doing, Thomas? Don't be a jerk. God, you know, how many jerks are there on social media? COVID with a bunch of smile, crying faces... I don't know what your message is, Thomas, but go away. Don't come back. Um, Jose Pablo Fallas. Um, 123 A equals asado. Oh, okay. I think he's saying that 123 A, which is the pork, I mean the beef short ribs, are really good on asado. And that's the um, Brazilian and Argentina technique of cooking um, over wood, and it's a great technique for those cuts, yes. And I don't mean to belittle COVID, by the way. I just, we're here to talk barbecue. I am just, I listen to NPR in the daytime. I listen to uh, the news every night of dinner. I read two newspapers every morning. I just, forgive me if I make light of anybody's pain and somebody has had somebody who has been ill. I don't mean to do that. I just don't want to talk about COVID tonight. Um, Greg White had asked, how should I adjust time temp for my pit barrel cooker? Very interesting that you should ask. The Pitmaster Club, our, the membership part of our website, is having a, we call it happy hour meeting, a week from tonight. First Thursday of every month, we have these happy hours. It's a Zoom webinar, and the subject is Pit Barrel Cooker. And we have with us Noah, who is the owner of the Pit Barrel Cooker company. We've got a bunch of people on the panel who cook on pit barrels, and they know everything there is. Um, you need to be a member of the Pit ba uh, Pitmaster Club, which is 24 bucks a year, but take the 30-day free trial and you can still come. So go to AmazingRibs.com, sign up for the 30-day trial, and go to the section that says audio video, and you'll get the link to the Zoom seminar, and come on down. Uh, we'll be talking a whole hour of uh, Pit Barrel Cooker with the guy who invented it. Um, Jim Peach, can you cook with just wood chunks in a Kamado? Yeah, it's not easy. 
Um, one of the problems with Kamados is the air... You're always dealing in any kind of combustion situation with the blend of oxygen and um, fuel. And, um, I mean, you can throw logs in a Kamado. Um, um, you're you're going to have to fiddle with it. <clears throat> and the best thing you can do is fiddle with it without food. You know, I mean, go out, get, get yourself some, some lumber, you know, get some apple or cherry that's been chopped down, make sure it's dry, chop it up into chunks. Um, you can use charcoal to get it started. That's a good technique. Um, get it going, get it rolling. Let it burn. You want flame. This is a common misconception. People complain, I throw wood chunks on my fire and it catches on fire and burns. That's good. You don't want the wood to smolder. When it's smoldering, it makes funky flavors. And big white billowing smoke may look cool, but what you really want is that wood to burn. You want yellow flame. When you're, it's burning, it's burning off the impurities. And you won't see a lot of smoke because the particles are too small to see. But it's the best tasting smoke. That's blue smoke. Okay? Okay. What do I think about Southern Pride smokers? They're my favorite commercial smokers. Um, these are smokers that are made primarily for restaurants and caterers. Um, when I go to a restaurant and I really love their meat, I ask what they're cooking on. The two most popular are Southern Pride and Old Hickory. And then there's a, a number of other brands. And it seems to me that the, the ones that I like the best are Southern Prides. Um, but they're, the Old Hickories, I know people who really know how to cook and they swear by Old Hickories. So, um, but I'm not a commercial. I've never cooked on one myself. I've never run a restaurant kitchen, so um, can't say for that. Do I have a recipe for injecting uh, a turkey breast? Yeah, in fact, I have this massive article that will put you to sleep on cooking turkey, and in it we talk about injecting. And I've played with, and I give you a technique for butterballing. That's how Butterball got its name. They used to inject it with butter. And you can do that. There's a trick to it. Um, because when you take a cold turkey breast and you inject it with butter, immediately it gets cold. It solidifies. It clogs up the injector and everything. The trick is, is to get the meat warm. Start cooking with it and inject it when it's warm so it doesn't um, solidify the butter. Uh, but you can also inject with um, oils. Um, uh, you can inject, in fact, um, Butcher Blend makes injections, the best injections in the game for all meats, briskets, and he has a butter flavored oil that's perfect for injecting. Yeah, um, David Cans is talking about the Weber smoke fire. He want, really wanted one, so did I. Um, and then the world blew up. Everybody said it's a piece of junk um, because they didn't understand it. They didn't know how to use it. We tested it. It definitely has flaws. We gave it a mediocre score. But if you um, understand what the flaws are, it's got some real cool benefits. It is the only pellet smoker I have ever encountered that can really sear a steak properly. Now, I don't want to get into an argument with all you Traeger lovers. Um, I, and I, I, love, I love my Traegers. They're wonderful. But you need infrared radiation to get a good dark sear on me. And all the pellet smokers are just like your indoor oven. They're warm air cookers. And that's convection cooking. And it's perfect, it's wonderful for smoking, for roasting, for baking. But if you want to sear something, if you want a dark brown mahogany cover on your 130 degree steak, you need either hot metal conduction or infrared radiation. And you get infrared radiation by exposing the meat to glowing coals or flame and the only pellet smoker that gives you exposure to flame 
is the Weber Smoke Fire. And I, the first thing I did when I got my hands on one is I threw steaks on it and it seared it beautifully. And I have a, a Mac 2 Star. I love this thing to death. We've tested uh, maybe 50 different pellet smokers. Love them, love them, love them. But I can't get, I, I can get a better sear on a $30 hibachi. So um, what I consider a proper sear. I'm going to get all kinds of arguments. Oh, I get wonderful sears. Send me a picture. No, that's not a good sear. I mean, cordovan, mahogany, dark brown, edge to edge, and the inside has to be 130 degrees, bumper to bumper, rosy color. You show me that, and I'll eat my words. And I know Doug Scheidling is out there going, I'm going to kick your ass, meathead. Because <clears throat> he, is, he is really skilled at pellet smokers, but um, I'll, I'll arm wrestle you on this one, Doug. Um, Jose Pablo Fallas is saying that 123A, which is the short rib section that I talked about, he says in Argentina it's called asado. I'm not going to argue with somebody named Jose Pablo Fallas over what asado is, but I have always thought asado was a technique for cooking, and you could use it on all kinds of meats, not just the rib section. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I think asado is, not only is it a technique for cooking, but it's like the word barbecue. It's, it can also be an event. Let's have an asado, um, as I understand the term. Now, the rib section may be a popular cut for asado, but I don't think it's the same thing as asado. But, you know, you got people in North Carolina and South Carolina that say, uh, barbecue is only pork, you know, so everybody has their own definitions. The drawer open behind me is dry. <laughs> I'll close it. This is my envelope drawer. <laughs> That's funny. You're, you're like me. I hate to tell you. <sighs> Uh, that was Ryan Lloyd. You're a fetishist, Ryan. I wouldn't want to be married to you. <laughs> well, we usually go an hour, and we're into an hour and a half, but I still got a few questions left, so I'll, I'll stick around until we've answered most of them, or all of them. Um, Craig Dashell, is it po possible to break down a pork butt competition style if it is finished at 200? Yeah. I.e. tubes, pulled, sliced money muscle. I'm not familiar with the muscle groups. And also, I take the whole butt up to 200. Will everything just pull apart? I don't compete um, for a variety of reasons. I don't have time. It's a very expensive sport now. I mean, you got to have a trailer and you got to have all the gadgets and stuff. And, it, it you know, it's, it's three days of down the tube traveling cross country. Um, so I just don't compete. Plus, I'd probably get my butt kicked because these guys are really good. And they know how to cook for the judges. I cook for my friends and family. Um, I don't know all of those muscle groups either. I have pictures of what the money muscle. There's one segment of the pork butt. It's called the money muscle. It's got like tiger stripe. And it's really, it's like tenderloin. It's a di it, it's very different. The, the, the pork butt, which is the shoulder, not the rump, believe it or not. And think about the shoulder. It is your shoulder. It's a very complicated group of muscles. You've got these, if you've ever seen, you know, pictures of the muscles in here, you've got the one wrapping around here, you got the one coming up here, you got the shoulder blade in there, which is a Y-shaped bone, and you got all these muscle groups. There must be six or eight different muscles in there. And the really good competition cooks know every single muscle. And this muscle is best for slicing, and this muscle is best for pulling. I don't know them as well as they do. Um, best thing to do is when we get out of this mess um, is to go to a barbecue competition and befriend one of the cooks and ask them, can you show me the different muscle groups or talk to me or teach me? I've been really lucky. I befriended Darren Worth a few years back. 
Darren may be the hottest cook on the circuit right now. He owns he owns Iowa Smoky D's restaurants in Iowa, and he he I mean his food is just brilliant. I can't even come close to him in a competition. He's just and he's been teaching me how to cook competition, and I'm sworn to secrecy on some things. But we do have a section on competition cooking on our site, and we do have a recipe from Darren, and it may be the pork butt. I forget. I know we got Tuffy Stone's pork butt. Um, the 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 money muscle is the one they slice, that for sure, and it's it's on the out exterior, and they kind of set. They're not allowed to separate it, so they carve it down to it's hanging on by a thread, and that that one they take off and they slice it into into medallions, and most everything else they shred or pull. I got um, Jose back saying, yeah, it means both things. Okay. I thought I had that. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan said he was, he's OCD. That's why the drawer's driving the bus. You're not going to complain about the cardboard boxes? If you'd been here last month, they were only half full. Now they're more full. That's filing. I got to do my filing. And if, you, if you're paying attention, that's... Um, uh, Gigal Cote de Rhone, which is like 15 bucks a bottle, and it's awesome. Jimbo, or is it Jim Bowie? Jim Bowie, Jim Bowie. I'm oh, sorry, you hear that all the time. I'm sorry. I try not to make that dumb thing mistake. Jimbo, I struggle hitting a perfect medium doneness in my steak cookoffs. What final internal temp will result in a nice pink medium doneness? Well, <clears throat> okay. Um, we publish oh, a meat temperature guide um, that has all that. And it's, it's on the website for free. Um, you can get it, but you can also order this on Amazon for about 10 bucks. We don't sell it. Um, the guys at Grillgate sell it, but it's my design. Um, and it's got all your basic cork. Look at all that. Look at all that temp. It's got everything on it, for crying out loud. Um, but, <clears throat> I mean, um, what they call Pittsburgh, or bleu, um, it's really almost raw, it is 110 to 120. Rare is 120 to 130. Um, medium rare, which is your, I think, ideal temp, um, 130 to 135. And I do not know why these steak cook-offs don't tell the competitors to cook to medium rare but the steak cook-offs all insist on medium which is 140 um, uh, 135 to 145 135 to 145 you got to experiment it's in that's a 10 degree range and it's a pretty good size range um, 140 is what I shoot for when I want medium at medium it's pink but it's not rosy like it is at medium rare it's a little drier than at medium rare um, so when, you know, you have two sources of moisture, um, in a steak, you have, um, water and fat. So you really want to get, if you have to cook to medium, which is above ideal for water, you want to have a really marbled prime USDA prime or, uh, now often at these steak co competitions, <clears throat> they provide the steak. So you're stuck with what they got. Just pick the most marbled you can find. And um, keep the temp, the cooking temp down. Take your time. I'm a big fan of reverse sear, like we talked about with the chicken. Start slow and gentle. Sear at the end, and take it up. Try, try. Do, I mean, you. I mean, if you're going to compete in anything, you have to practice, practice, practice. You know the old joke about how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Um, so you've got to cook these steaks at home until you can do it with your eyes closed. And um, and see which temperature you prefer, 135, 140, or 145. Um, and if you know somebody who judges, I've judged them, um, have them offer an opinion. Um, but um, um, experiment. And remember, carryover cooking. If it's 140 on the oven, on the grill, and you take it off, 
and you put it in a styrofoam clamshell and send it to the judging area where it's got to go through somebody who puts a number on it and it's got to sit around. It's going to continue to cook. The exterior layers of the meat have had energy in, uh, uh, built up in it. And that energy will work its way down to the center, especially with the lid closed. If it's sitting open, a lot of that energy will bleed off and it won't carry over so much. But with that clamshell closed, it's going to continue to cook. So you got to allow for that. So do your experiments, 135, 140, 145, and let it sit for 10 minutes or so to, fact, to, to simulate what's going to happen in the competition. See what you think. Yeah, uh, Jose is uh, elaborating on what asado is. David Krantz, is there any reason or advantages to splitting a brisker packet, pa packer, separate, flat, and pointed in pieces? And you know, I've heard of people doing this. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I've been doing it more and more lately. It just makes, it's like I was saying before about chicken. When you cook a whole animal, a whole hog, a whole turkey, a whole chicken, you're making compromises. You've got mu different muscles, different muscle groups, and they're ideally cooked to different temperatures. And that's what you've got with a brisket. You have two muscles. You've got the flat and the point, which lays on top of the flat at a slight angle. And the grain goes differently. And the point is more marbled than the flat. And there's this thick fat layer in between. And the flat has this edge that is very thin and then in the place where the point lays on top of the flat it's very thick so you're gonna the tendency is to overcook the point of the flat the point of the flat the end of the flat uh, or undercook where the two overlap and so it makes absolutely perfect sense to separate the point and the flat um, now they present different issues the flat is just a gorgeous, even flat. I mean, it lays, you peel off all that fat on both sides. It's almost uniform in thickness to a little thinness on one end. Um, the grain runs perfect. Great for slicing, for sandwiches. Um, uh, great for making corned beef. I mean, perfect. But it tends to be lean, and it can be drier. But if you cook it separately, you're going to get beautiful <coughs> um, smoke ring all around. When you separate the flat of uh, the point, the point is weird. It's going to be jagged. It's got, you know, it's almost like a, a lamb uh, leg. It's got all these hills and valleys. But the good news is, is the point, since it's fattier, is what a lot of competition cooks use to make burnt ends. What's interesting is, is that when you separate them, and I'm just going to throw rough numbers, they're not precise. It's almost one-third, one-third, one-third. If you get a whole pack of brisket and you trim off, you separate point and flat, you trim off all the surface fat, which does you no good. It can't penetrate. All it does is prevent your seasonings, your rubs, from being in contact with the meat. Almost a third of that packer is fat. Now, I peel it off and I freeze much of it and I use it in my hamburger grinds. So it's not waste, but it, you know, it's wasted. Um, so now you've got almost a little more than a third of the meat is flat, and almost a third of it, a little less than a third, is the point. One third, one third, one third. Almost. It's not precise. So um, uh, if you love burnt ends, and who doesn't, um, it's a great technique. Um, separate the point from the flat. Cook them separately. Um, and make burn ends from the point. If you're competing, uh, it's another issue. Um, you can still do it that way too. And I know more and more competition cooks are doing that. And it makes perfect sense. Um, you, you, you've got these two entirely different muscles. Yeah, Cannon Taylor is agreeing that beef at medium rare is perfect for flank tenderloin strip and rib loins. Absolutely. I mean, beef at medium rare is just... 
that, that's your idea. We know we can measure it's most tender and most juicy at that temperature. We can measure how there's a gizmo called the Warner Bratzler machine. It's like an artificial tooth and it goes into the meat and it, we can measure how much pressure it takes to cut through the meat. Um, Jason Davies asks, what's my all-time favorite protein to cook on the queue? I'll tell you, if you gave me a rack of lamb and a ribeye steak and you cooked them perfectly and set them down in front of me, I would die of starvation trying to decide which to eat first. I'm a huge fan of lamb as well as I am of beef. Um, I, 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 you know, I love flank steak. It's a tougher cut, but if you cook it properly and cut it thin, it's got just gobs of flavor. And I think one of the best recipes on AmazingRibs.com is the pastrami. Uh, and I know a bunch of you have tried it. It's just killer. We were, the, I think, the first website to put a pastrami recipe out there, and everybody's done it now. Our, it's really good, though. My recipe is really killer. Um, uh, try the pastrami. Well, try the pastrami is a good way to end this thing. Um, uh, wrap, let's wrap it up. Um, uh, we are doing, I, I, you know, I don't know what's happened with the video feed here. I don't know if it's jumping or choppy. I'll watch it. I'm using a new tool that's supposed to be simulcasting. I have this awful black box here that I can't make go away. I'll fix this and get it worked out. Um, um, next Thursday we're using, we're doing a, um, Zoom webinar that we've got the technology down on. <clears throat> um, on the pit barrel cooker for the first hour and then the second hour or not just pit barrel but all barrel cookers um, with the owner of pit barrel there and then we're doing um, uh, and then the second hour is just open Q&A like this it won't be just me we're going to have a bunch of other guys who know stuff um, and uh, it should be a lot of fun um, if you're not a member consider joining or at least taking the free 30 day trial there's some real benefits to membership. We really try to make it worth your while, but it also supports me and uh, my team because uh, we don't have a big corporate parent and we don't take uh, payoffs and uh, do all the stuff that, you know, we don't sell rubs, we don't sell sauces, um, we don't uh, take endorse, we do endorsements, we don't take paid placements of articles, you know. Uh, we, we, you know, manufacturers can't write articles for us. They do elsewhere. So, um, come on down, uh, next Thursday, if you like, and, uh, join that discussion. Otherwise we'll be back a month from now, the last Thursday of the month to take on another topic. We'll probably talk about, um, ribs, uh, coming up on 4th of July. For me, that means ribs. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, brainstorm on the subject of ribs and uh, whatever else interests you. And uh, uh, sign up for our email newsletter, um, Smoke Signals. Um, really uh, keep you up to date on what's new on our website. All the new reviews of products and so on. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. And uh, I uh, promise to get the, uh, the technology straightened out by next month. Salute.